For those who don't know Dwiggins, W.A. Dwiggins was a graphic designer, he was a type designer, he was a book designer, he was an advertising designer. Um, in his spare time, he uh, made marionettes. Uh, he wrote about uh, things in his profession. He wrote about, he wrote uh, plays and other uh, non-design stories. And so to many people, he's fascinating because of these different activities. He was born in 1880 in Martinsville, Ohio. And within a few months, his father moved the family to Richmond, Indiana where they lived for 10 years. His father died of uh, pneumonia during the big flu epidemic of 1889, probably not as well known as one of 1918, though his father had on adult onset diabetes, which must have hastened his, uh, his death. So then his mother and he moved about uh, for a couple of years before they settled in Cambridge, Ohio in the mid-1890s. And then in 1899, he went to art school in Chicago. The school he went to was the Frank Holmes School. Now, before we get there, what you're seeing is the earliest known lettering by Dwiggins. Somewhere in the mid-1880s, Willie Dwiggins, his book, and I like all the curly numbers. Uh, and up above, you can see his mother's handwriting. That's not his handwriting at the top. The title of the talk that I gave came from an article he wrote in, the 19, uh, in 1919 about Roman letter forms. And I thought it was an interesting phrase, so I stuck it out of my title. So the Frank Holmes School in Chicago, it was run by Frank Holmes, a newspaper artist, and his wife. And it was just a couple rooms on a building on Michigan Avenue. It was a commercial art school. Holm was trying to teach people uh, how to be newspaper illustrators, but also commercial artists. Uh, and it was an amazing, amazing place. It didn't last very long. It was, it was founded in 1898, basically closed down in 1904, because Holm got tuberculosis and had to move various places in the country to try to improve his health, which didn't work. Dwiggins was there from fall of 1899 to probably sometime in 1901. We don't exactly know when he left. But at the school, it had some excellent people as teachers. The Lay and Decker brothers, who were famous for posters back then, were teaching. And somebody who at the time was not famous but became famous was teaching there, Fred Gowdy. Gowdy is known as probably the most famous American type designer of the first half of the 20th century. And at this point, he'd only done like one typeface and he'd been a bookkeeper in Detroit before going back to Chicago. But he taught a class in decoration and lettering. And Dwiggins was one of his students. Another student was Oswald Cooper. So with Dwiggins there, Cooper there, and Gowdy, you have three of the four most important type designers of the first half of the 20th century in America. Just a strange zeitgeist coincidence. The fourth was Morris Fuller Benton, if anybody wants to know. So Gaudi's influence is very important. And this is the arts and crafts era, and also the Art Nouveau era in the 1890s. But Art Nouveau doesn't have a big influence in Chicago, other than filtered through Will Bradley. It's mainly William Morris's influence in arts and crafts that people are interested in making having private presses, creating their own typefaces, and getting interested in medieval letter forms and early Venetian letter forms, you know, rugged Roman letter forms, and not pale, febrile letter forms that were typical of the 19th century, were really flowery ones. So what you're seeing are three book plates that Dwiggins uh, did in these early years. Uh, the one on the left, Della uh, Pertum Fordyce, is actually a wood block. Uh, and sa same with the one for Mabel Hoyle. That was, that, became, that was his girlfriend at the time, became his wife. And then Eleanor Siegfried Hadley was uh, a relative uh, on his uh, mother's side, the family, the Siegfried side. And you're seeing, uh, I think, the influence of um, Gordon Craig in the Della Pertum Fordyce one, who was a uh, British uh, designer. And possibly, um, William Fisher in the one in the middle. These are contemporary people who aren't well known anymore. But the lettering is heavy and chunky and deliberately, you know, in this sort of antique way. 
These are pieces that Dwiggins did circa 1901. The athletics one has definitely uh, been linked to um, a high school yearbook in his hometown of Cambridge. After he graduated, he was, he was hired to do a uh, cover and a series of headings for the yearbook. The current topics I haven't been able to identify. I suspect it might have been a class project. And you can see that the illustrations uh, reflect some of the uh, designs of the period. Uh, in fact, the one at the top, I think, is a little bit of white paint on the left of it. The mail pouch, I used to think, was a student project also. But it turns out it was a publication done by some high school students in his hometown of Cambridge a few years after he graduated. All I've ever found out about was a few news items and then this poster. Dwiggins, as a designer, did very few large items. He did very few posters or broadsides in his career. Uh, and, and this is one of them. There's a copy in, Bo there's a copy in uh, Washington. Uh, the, the Colorado summer outing is from an ad in House Beautiful that I came across. And I think it's a, co a combination of Gowdy and Dwiggins. So after Dwiggins uh, left the Frank Holmes School, and it was a school where you, you could pay by the week to study. So people could just go in and out, which makes it really hard to know exactly when he left. Um, but by 1901, 1902, he's got a studio with Fred Gowdy on Michigan Avenue. And at one point, he's actually living with the Gowdys out in the northern part of Chicago in a, in a street that I, I can't seem to find the address that exists anymore. But there are definitely some uh, projects that they work together. Some of them are signed with their initials joined together, like DG, D for Dwiggins, G for Gowdy. And this one looks like Gowdy's lettering and Dwiggins' illustration. And knowing that Dwiggins had done some work uh, for the Santa Fe, uh, I'm, 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 I'm guessing that this is his uh, design. Usually the first book that's, that's attributed to him is this book, The Gift of the Magic Staff, in 1901. There's actually a book that comes out a few months earlier that he'd worked on with Fred Gowdy called In a Balcony. Uh, but this book, uh, he did the cover and all the illustrations. And one of his fellow students uh, did decorations, Ella Bryson, in it. It was a, it was a book for children from a religious publishing house. The Inland Printer, cover is, is, is one that only Dwiggins did. There's also an inland printer cover where Dwiggins and Gowdy uh, combine their talents. This one's 1903, as you can see, and he, he's copied a famous image of Christopher Plantan for the, for the illustration, and the lettering is following Fred Gowdy. So when I'm talking about the influence of Gowdy, the letters that Gowdy was doing, influenced by William Morris and this interest in getting back to heavier, stronger letter forms, you find letters that are old style, uh, Roman, and then Gowdy liked this sort of leaning italic. You can see the word the, with that, that H that sort of falls over. And you can see in the gift of the magic staff that curly T that looks like a C, in the word the, you can find that in some of Gowdy's work too. This is the, the one definite piece that, Gowdy, that Dwiggins did for the Santa Fe. Uh, there's a few pieces of it, not the whole thing, up in Boston, the Dwiggins collection, but there are, co there are copies um, in Denver and I believe in San Francisco. I think I found a copy of this. Oh, no. Was it Stanford? Um, it's a little booklet intended to promote this hotel uh, in uh, New Mexico on the Santa Fe uh, line. And Fred Harvey did apparently a series of hotels, but all the other booklets I've seen were, were done by other people. But Dwiggins did the border and the lettering here. And if you look carefully, you can see um, his initials, his initial WD. Do I have a pointer on here? Yeah, right here, WD. And if you look carefully, they're flopped. So he just took the border and flopped it for the left side. The interior of that book, I'm not showing you the rest of it, has illustrations he did in two different styles, along with photographs of, of the hotel. 
So now I'm going to start getting into specific, more general styles, uh, things like Roman, black letter, uncials, which those of you who are calligraphers will know what we're talking about. So I'm going to, look, I'm going to show you uh, his Roman capitals as they evolve over time. And a lot of, a lot of these, these early images in these different styles are going to be from a series of greeting cards that he did for a man in Boston called Alfred Bartlett. So Dwiggins, after he's working with Gowdy for a year or two in Chicago, is kind of getting homesick for his girlfriend in Cambridge, for his mother, and just, I, he never really liked big cities. And if you realize that when he was growing up, the biggest city he'd been in before he went to Chicago was about 15,000 people. Chicago was a million <laughs> back then. So that must have been quite a shock. And of course, a city that was booming, full of stockyards, their smells, uh, eleva elevated, uh, all sorts of big city, you know, lures and uh, things that wouldn't have found in Cambridge, Ohio, or Richmond, Indiana. And he went back to Cambridge in the spring of 1903 and tried to set up a private press. It was still the rage to do. Though his private press got into muckraking and all sorts of very interesting things besides the usual private press stuff. But then, in the summer of 1904, Fred Gowdy, who had moved from a uh, suburb of Chicago, where he had a private press, to Massachusetts, Hingham, Massachusetts, a town on the South Shore uh, below Boston. And Gowdy had moved there because there was the Arts and Crafts Society in this small town. And after he moved, he wanted to ask Oz Cooper to join him. But Cooper was busy trying to run the Frank Home School while, while Holm was getting his tuberculosis treatments in North Carolina. So he asked Dwiggins if he would come and work with him in Hingham. And Dwiggins had just gotten married. And they went off to, to Hingham as their honeymoon <laughs> and lived with the Gowdies for a couple of months in a house that had the Gowdies, their, 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 their young son, a giant printing press. <laughs> it must have been not, not a great idea to start your, your, your married life. <laughs> and by the, early, by the early, uh, early 1905, he and his wife had found a home of their own to rent. Uh, and they stayed in Hingham for the rest of their life. Dwiggins dying in 1956, his wife in 1968. So once he uh, moved out of Gowdy, he also quit working for Gowdy's Village Press. And he set up as a freelance designer. And among his, uh, his first clients was a man named Alfred Bartlett in Boston. Bartlett uh, was a, a publisher of small books, sort of gift books, and of greeting cards. He's considered one of the important uh, founders of greeting cards as an industry. He called them motto cards, dodgers, leaflets, all sorts of other names. But he was kind of like a miniature Hallmark cards. And, it was, and he was you know, following in the, in the arts and crafts tradition. I mean, he was trying to have everything a nice, a nice uh, handmade paper with deckle edges and hiring calligraphers and illuminators to do things and have them printed by people like D.B. Updike, the preeminent printer in Boston. So this is one of these cards. You can see this one actually has a copyright on it. Some of them don't, aren't dated. Some of them we've, we've figured out what the dates are. And you can see how much better his lettering has gotten. We're talking six years later. Uh, very excellent uh, Roman capitals, including his Y's that are curved, we call the Greek fashion. And a little bit of italic for the uh, credit for Henry Turner Bailey, who was an educator in the arts. There's a tiny book plate he did for himself, um, where it says it has, it has uh, Will, Will Dwiggins, and his name changes over time. To some people, he's Willie, to his mother, to his wife, he's William. To some of his, to his early friends and colleagues, he's Will. When he's older, he's called Bill to his friends. People who don't, don't know him call him W-A-D or Wad or Dwig. Though he has a cousin who does cartoons, is also known as Dwig, which can be confusing. <laughs> so here he is as Will Dwiggins in Hingham. And this little uh, image of a, of a scribe is a common one that he uses. There is his typical arts and crafts influence. And later on, he will get rid of it. 
And then the book you're seeing, which is 1906, the, the book plate is somewhere between 1905, 1906. It's, it's not dated. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's a year or so after he's gotten to Hingham and certainly before 1907, 1908. The book is dated. It's 1906. It was printed by Updike, who was a preeminent printer in Boston, and becomes an important client along with Bartlett. And so he's done just the, the binding cover. Elliot was president of Harvard. And the decoration is his. Now, in making my presentation, I've, I've changed the scale of things. So you're seeing this book plate on the left way too big compared to the paper promotion on the right. But here you can see a much more refined, uh, elegant Roman capitals. So if you think back about those heavy Gaudi-esque ones that I first showed you, the, the, the Elizabeth Mary Hill uh, book plate is somewhere around 1908, 1909. And of course, he's made a pun out of her name and showed her house on a little hill, because the illustration is also his. What you see on the, on the right, I was, in, I was in Japan, is a specimen book for a paper company, Strathmore Paper, 1919. And you can see the style of Roman capitals starts to have little Dwiggins features, like the way the bottoms of the A's are made. Uh, or the proportion of the bowl of the R to the leg. He did the illustration, and the entire specimen book is a marvel. Every image in it is by him, showing work he either had already done or fictitious work. And all the, all the lettering identifying the different paper stocks and weights is his. So that's 1919. I've jumped ahead 10 years with that. Uh, Strathmore piece. About, about the same time he did this book plate or mailing label for a project that he and his cousin Lawrence Siegfried did. Uh, they did a little booklet called An Extract from Investigations into the Physical Properties of Books as They Are Made. And it was a little, uh, essentially a diatribe about how poor books in America were. And so they, they had to have a label for their business and that Archer shows up as a common theme in Dwiggins' life. And he always described it as shooting for the stars, you know, aiming high. What you're seeing uh, on the right is, is original artwork around 1920-21. The book uh, changed its title. This is not, and so this is not the final artwork. Uh, but it's got this wonderful Russian iconic image and it's all about uh, the ambassador to Russia and his experiences during the revolution and afterward. This is right after the Russian Revolution. It's a Yale University Press book. So in the early days in Boston, in the Hingham area, Dwiggins is working primarily for Bartlett and for Updike doing work, all sorts of stuff. By the, mid, by the early teens, he gets another patron, a man named Brad Stevens, who's really big on trying to get people in the graphic arts businesses, the printing businesses, to cooperate, to collaborate on things. And he's also very big on direct marketing, direct advertising. What direct advertising means is any sort of design that goes directly to the, the, the customer, the client, the recipient. So instead of putting an ad in a magazine or a newspaper, if you mail a letter out to them, encourage them to buy something, if you send them a catalog, if you send them a brochure, if you, all those things are direct advertising. It's now, like called, now it's called direct marketing. And he set up a magazine called Direct Advertising, and he got a group of paper companies to sponsor it as a cooperative effort. And Dwiggins was his prime designer. Dwiggins did the cover, which for about, from roughly 1917 to about 1933, looked exactly like this, except that each issue had a different color for the paper and different colors for the ink, but the exact same design. And I think Dwiggins played with the colors of those and learned about color by changing them. I just chose one that I like, the purple on the, the blue with the orangey red. What's next to it, is another paper industry book, at which he did through Mr. Stevens. And that was for two companies that joined up to do a little publication in the mid-20s. 
and there's, there's two different versions of these covers as they change midway. Uh, this is number 25 out of, I think 30 something are done. Um, this is 1927. And you can see variations in his Roman caps, especially the, the R in paper is a typical Dwiggins letter with the way the leg kicks out and the way the bowl is thinner in weight. He also did the uh, little mark in the center, papers at print, as, as a slogan. Now I'm going back a little bit in time, and I'm showing you examples of rustic and rustic-like Roman capitals. For those who know calligraphy or don't know calligraphy, rustic is a narrow, a little more fluid form of, ro of Roman capitals uh, that goes back to the Roman Empire, made as graffiti and also as small manuscript letters. And Dwiggins, for some reason, has chosen that for this 1909 book cover, The Vermilion Pencil, which is about, a story about people in China. And then a couple years later, 1912, he does this, uh, <clears throat> this title for a trade magazine advertising and selling. And he does not only the lettering there, but the entire border. And you can see the various tools that he's put in as the tools of the trade. It lasted only a couple of years. They kept mucking with it. They began changing the colors. They began changing the border. Pretty soon, the entire thing fell apart and was gone. You know, they didn't appreciate good design. Model letterhead is done for the same one of the two companies that did the paper book, Crocker McElwain, a paper company up, up in um, Massachusetts. And Dwiggins did this. What it is is the cover of a folder that has samples of paper inside, sample letterheads to show you what you can do with the stationery. And some of those in the, in the portfolios are stationaries by Dwiggins. Some are real designs, some are fake designs inside. But this cover is a very lovely condensed Roman capital. And that's from about, that's the mid-20s, somewhere in 1924. He also did the pattern, the stencil pattern around it. The New Deal in Old Rome is a book jacket. So Dwiggins was doing all this advertising work from 1905 through the 1920s, but he wanted to do books, which is typical of people from the arts and crafts era. And in 1922, when he, slash 23, when he discovered he had adult onset diabetes like his father, he began telling friends, I'm getting out of the advertising business. I don't like it. I hate it. I want to do books. But it took him over a nearly the end of the decade to really get out. He was still doing important advertising work in the early 30s. It paid better you know, than book work. But when he finally uh, met his, his perfect match, which was Alfred Knopf, he was a book designer from 1934 to 1956, uh, Knopf's premier freelance book designer. His first books for Knopf were in 1926, but it wasn't until 34 that he was doing entire books and on a regular basis. And this is from 1939, The New Deal in Old Rome, which is a, a, which is a play on FDR's New Deal, linking it to what was happening in Old Rome by the author. It's the first book to use uh, Dwiggins' Caledonia typeface. And here he's used this condensed, sort of rustic-like uh, Roman capitals to suggest old Rome, but also to fit the title in. <laughs> a couple other examples, the Boylston Street Magazine, which was a magazine for uh, businesses on Boylston Street in Boston, a major shopping street uh, in the Back Bay. Dwiggins, uh, once he and decided, began working with Bartlett in 19, uh, actually, after being working with Bartlett, uh, Bartlett tried to convince him to move in to, to his uh, space. And Updike warned him against it, but Dwiggins decided to take the offer and move from Hingham as a studio to Boston in 1910. And that was because he'd be closer to his clients, much easier to do work, and not have to, not have to commute on the train. And Updike was right, you know, up, you know he got, Bartlett got a lot of work out of him, but also he got a lot of new clients that made him move away from Bartlett. And as he moved his studio over the next uh, decade, he ended up on Boylston Street. And, and th th that's I, probably why the merchants asked him to do the design of their magazine, which only lasted for a year or two. There's uh, only two issues I've ever seen. 
The Warren Standard was another paper company job. He did a lot of paperwork, far more than most people realize, uh, because of Brad Stevens and then because of Warren. Warren was part of the original Brad Stevens consortium, but then they left around 1918, but Dwiggins did a, a lot of work with them directly uh, through their, their, their uh, publicity person uh, from the uh, mid-teens through, through the mid to late 30s. And this is uh, a publication that they did in various issues, and each one had a different color. That illustration is by him. It looks like a technical drawing. And you have to realize, I'm focusing on lettering and calligraphy, but Dwiggins is, is a designer. In his day, they called them commercial artists. And you had to have three, and there were three basic skills, being, doing illustration, doing decoration, doing lettering. Some people were good at one. Dwiggins was good at all three. Another paper company piece, this is for a gummed paper company uh, in New Jersey. And all I've ever seen of it are reproductions in magazines, never the actual item. These were gummed labels that you could buy. And this one is, I think, influenced by some German designs of the time. This is uh, in, the, in the teens. And you'll find some of this sort of loose lettering by Dwiggins elsewhere, this kind of almost drippy stuff, and very soft. Um, and the guy's putting paste or gum on paper. That's what, it didn't last long, that, that one. So I'm gonna move from Roman caps to black letter, which will make Grendel excited. Or she'll probably not like the actual interpretations. The earliest signed, uh, or at least dated, I should say, example of Dwiggins' lettering is this piece on the left from a uh, account book of his father's. Uh, he had an account book of his father's after his father died, which he would, he would doodle in it. It's full of battleships and, and, and battles and guys in armor and, and maps and uh, all sorts of things. And there's this bit of lettering, which has some Lombardic capitals. And then we have this undated sample uh, where he's also got some black letters, some, some textura. Like, Upside down, unfortunately. I couldn't decide which way to turn it for you guys. <laughs> but you see, it's drawn, which is not surprising. I mean, when he was studying with Gaudi, people drew these letters. They didn't realize that you were making them with a broad edge pen. This is before Edward Johnston did his writing and lettering. That's 1906. And this is, this is, of course, America. You didn't have a lot of models other than, you know, Zaner Blozer or the various Spencerian people, the pointed pen, you know, and grocers. So some early examples of this black letter, the ridge shop, that's a woodcut. The ridge shop was an attempt at a private press by Dwiggins, Oz Cooper, and a third student at the Frank Holmes School um, in Park Ridge, <coughs> uh, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Other than this, 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 this letterhead, there's not much that we know they, they actually accomplished with their, with their shop. It may have just been a great idea that went, went nowhere. The other three are book plates he did uh, in those early years, 1900, roughly 1902. The one on the left for Clara Francis Hunter is a woman from his hometown of Cambridge, who I suspect he might have lived with in Chicago, because at one point she was in Chicago as a music teacher, but she was a friend of his mother's. Uh, then you see one for himself in the middle, which is beautiful, a bit of fracture in a circle. And then the one uh, for Ella Grimes. Rosemond was another Cambridge, Ohio uh, friend of his mother's, and that's done in rotunda. So we've got a couple different styles of that he's playing with a black litter. And you have to realize when he's doing this, you know, Gaudi is, is interested in black litter because that's a medieval thing that Morris would have been interested. So black litter and heavy Romans, but this is quite a variety of styles. And he must have been learning some of these things from books. And that's what I've been trying to track down because there aren't very many sources. There's only a couple, a couple books available in England and fewer in the United States that will show you examples. So now we're back to, to Hingham and working for Alfred Bartlett. And this is a bigger type of greeting card. It's this, you know, about, I don't know, six by nine. And I've actually tracked down where he got the B from. 
Uh, I mean, he was copying things from books. It was typical of the day. First, it's how you learn, but also everybody did that. I mean, you were expected to copy things. The four episodes from the York Mysteries only shows up in reproduction in various magazines. This is an example of his work. I've never found the, exact, the, the actual publication. It's 1906. Uh, he did some work for the Tavern Club, which was a private club in Boston, through D.B. Updike. But I don't know how he got this particular job. It might have been through Heinzelman, another printer in Boston, where he briefly supposedly had desk space, meaning he had a desk to work at, but not renting a room or anything. The Salon Certificate is 1907 for this photography organization. And once again, I've only found it as a reproduction. But I, I'm just, I just find those capital S and C amazing. And I wonder where he got the T from. I'm sure I've seen that initial T somewhere. You know, from some uh, printed book, probably in the Incunabula period. And everything is handwritten on these pages. I mean, there's no type on either of these other than the credit that came from the magazine at the bottom of the one on the left. Now these are two more cards, greeting cards. The one in green is not for Alfred Bartlett. Bartlett had a colleague, Edwin Gro uh, Edwin Grover, who ended up uh, in Chicago and he was um, working with, with, with publishers there, but he also was trying to have a small um, press and to do typical arts and crafts stuff called the Canterbury Company. And they also apparently made chocolates. <laughs> and they made children's toys along with their little booklets and greeting cards. Uh, and the one, on, the one in green comes from, I believe, the Canterbury uh, Company. Uh, it's signed with a little D in the lower left, right here, as an indication of Dwiggins. He signs his things in various ways in the early days. This one's not signed at all. The circa 1906 is, I think, Dorothy Abbey's uh, notation about when she thought it was done. It's certainly earlier than the other one, which is probably 1908. And one of my favorites is this one. Uh, Here's to thee and thy folks from me and my folks. An old Quaker health. Health means a greeting, you know, to your health. And Wiggins, uh, his, his parents were a mixed marriage. His mother was a Baptist and his father was a Quaker. And that was a problem, not for them, but for other people. Quakers don't recognize mixed marriages. And so there's no record of Dwiggins being born or, or his father getting married, because the Quakers, when, you know, you can find his father in records, but not his mother or him. And his wife was a Quaker, and they had to elope with his mother, the Baptist permission, and his mother and his wife got kicked out of the Quakers for marrying a Baptist, or at least, or at least the son of a, of a, of a, of a woman who was a Baptist. <laughs> so I'm wondering if the Quaker thing you know, was, to, was to his heart. His wife was always a Quaker. Uh, but I love that H. That H is stunning. Uh, and I'm sure he's found, he's found a source for it. Now, at this point, I'm thinking that a lot of his uh, sources may have come from Updike, because Updike uh, was a printer who did a lot of research into uh, printed books. And I know that in the work that Dwiggins did from Updike would often loan him books as source material to copy. And so he may have found a lot of stuff through Updike and not through libraries or museums or printed books. Uh, it's, The Romantic Germany is one of the nicest of his early book jackets that he did, along with the Vermilion Pencil, 1909. And that Y is a typical Dwiggins Y in black letter, the way he's got the, the bottom with the tail coming off uh, diagonally. Print was an early Brad Stevens publication that preceded direct advertising. It's not the same as a print magazine that just uh, went out of business about a year ago. It's totally separate, though apparently it had a huge circulation, 10,000 copies, but it's hard to find them. Uh, and like the direct advertising, what he did for this was he kept changing the colors, but left the design the same, uh, with that strange uh, decorative P. And the idea of mixing black letter and Roman that you're seeing in a lot of these things was typical of Fred Gowdy's work. 
And you know, it, it seemed to be you know, something that Wiggins liked to do also. Here's an example of rotunda from these little cards. It's, it's the same set as that one I showed you earlier that was in Roman caps uh, for Alfred Bartlett. And once again, I think he's following printed examples for that capital I. That's a capital I if you don't recognize that red thing. Then we got sort of a Batard example over on the left, also for Alfred Bartlett. And then what you're seeing on the right is a frontispiece for a book that Updike uh, printed that was for uh, Charles Jefferson, a reverend who was apparently a fairly uh, famous uh, pastor in New York. But it turns out he had grown up, that, that, that Jefferson came from Cambridge, Ohio. And I wonder if Twiggins ever realized he was working with a fellow Canterbridgean <laughs> uh, from there. But for that book the, called The Christmas Builders, Dwiggins did uh, the jacket, he did the frontispiece, the title page, and a couple of illustrations. It was one of his biggest projects for Updike. It's 1909. And so that border is Dwiggins, illustration is his, and the uh, sort of batard like lettering is his in red. The border actually is a copy of, of one, I think, from the Renaissance. I've found it a couple months ago. So we've seen a lot of black letter by Dwiggins, and it's all very early. It's all before 1910. And after that, it kind of disappears from his work. It's really hard to find examples of it. You can find Roman caps all the way through his career into the 50s. But he gets out of black letter. Part of that is getting away from the William Morris arts and crafts, archaic medieval thing. And that you can ascribe to Updike's influence. Updike, you know, seeing that as you know, a backward looking thing, you know. But also the clients. You know, he's doing commercial work. And when he starts doing book, when he starts getting into book design in the 20s. It's not needed as much, but if it's needed, if it's right for the topic, if it fits the subject, so the Scarlet Letter. And what he's doing with the Scarlet Letter, he's trying to make a book that looks like not the days of Hester Prynne, but the days of Nathaniel Hawthorne, the 1840s. So he's got this sort of Victorian black letter. It's beautifully done, for it's, but, it's, but it's not what you'd find if done by a proper calligrapher. It's more of a, of a letterer's, a drawn, pointed pen black letter. Gunnar's daughter, from a, from a Scandinavian author, Sigurd Unset, uh, he figured he had to have this, this black letter for the tale. And that's his illustration. And, and the signature most people know of his WAD in the upper left corner. The, the, the last things that I've been able to find chronologically of, of his in black letter are these two pieces. The Daily Jeffersonian was for his hometown newspaper. This was done for their celebration. Uh, in the 1940s. And it's a very stiff black letter. It's very atypical of, of Dwiggins, uh, that, the way the Jeffersonian is done. Uh, the decorations are his, very typical of what he's very famous for, his uh, stencil ornaments. It's an interesting mix of items. This is done in the late 40s. And then, about the same time, he did a paper promotion for Eastern Paper Company. They did a series of broadsides intended uh, to promote their paper, but talking about different typefaces. And it's odd that Dwiggins chose Cheltenham, a typeface that most people of his generation hated. <laughs> and he may not have cared what the typeface was. He may have thought it was kind of an interesting choice. Nobody else would choose it. I'll choose it. <laughs> but it's very odd the way he did this black letter. <laughs> for it. Anybody knows the Cheltenham typeface that Bertram Grosvenor Goodhue did in uh, circa 19, well, late 1890s, but it came out in 1902 and 1904. And Goodhue, who designed Cheltenham, had been a former colleague of Updike's. He's, he was an architect. He did um, a couple of famous churches in New York, I think uh, West Point, the Nebraska State Capitol. But along with this, uh, this Interesting, Cheltenham, I like the A in Atlantic and the, and the B in Bond. The C, I'm not sure I, I, go, I go for in Cheltenham. But the star of this is not the black letter, it's that decorative A. That's what that blue and red explosion is. That's an A, one of Dwiggins' stencil designs. Not black letter, but it's certainly cool. I've cropped the image to focus in on the lettering. So you go to so the Cheltenham, most of it's off to the side or it's just here. This is a Cheltenham typeface right here which was one of the most popular typefaces in the 20th century. 
A few angels, a little Art Nouveau, we're getting to the end. Now, if I was doing this as a chronological history of Dwiggins rather than a survey of lettering, I, I would have had this image on the left very quickly. And I usually read the whole thing. It, this is his announcement of going freelance in 1905. It's totally hand-lettered. And it's in a mix of upper and lower case letters, unchilesque. And what's interesting about it is he began, he, he got interested in doing an unchil-based typeface in the 40s. And the typeface looks a lot like this. <laughs> so he's had, he had these letter forms in his head for decades, even though he claimed that the typeface came from looking at uh, various paleographical books. Uh, and you can see some, some similar letters in this greeting card on the right, a friend's rebuke. So what I'm talking about, unsure if you don't, anybody, you don't know it, is a Roman lettering style. And unlike rustic, which is condensed and saves space, unshul saves you time, uh, but it's wide and more re legible. So instead of having like a square-shaped E, it's, a, it's like a round E. And it has letters that to the uninitiated look like small letters, but they're technically capitals. So, so letters pop up and drop down a little bit. And so you can, so there's a couple in here. Um, the G's in beggarly. And the way he's, uh, where's the other ones I wanted? Yeah, so the capital R mixed in and this F. It's not an unchul in, in a pure historical way. It's got little unchul qualities. And he did a couple uh, cards with this mixed case style. And then it kind of disappears until the mid-30s. And he's asked in 19, I gotta stop in two minutes apparently. Uh, he, I'm looking at the clock. He gets asked by, uh, he's, he's, he's they're doing a special uh, insert into a magazine called The Dolphin in the mid-30s about Dwiggins' work. And Philip Hofer of Harvard insists that the insert should include an original hand-done booklet. So Dwiggins does, does a little story of his own and writes it out in this unchilesque hand and is printed on a very thin, uh, uh, Chinese or Japanese paper. It's beautiful, the illustration by him in red. This is a detail, complete with his correction. You see the E, where he misspelled something? He didn't go back and read it, he just stuck it in. And it's kind of quickly done. There's, somebody made a typeface based on this. And it's unfortunate because the crudeness is fine on this paper, but when you see it digitally, it, it, it loses its quality. Uh, And then, towards the end of his life, he did a little broadside quote from Hokusai uh, about being old but still being able to do things, I think which, which was encouraging him. And that's a detail, right? Blew up the lettering. This is 1949, so he's, he's born in 1880. He's now 69 years old. And he's, got, he's gonna have cataracts in a year or two. He's got problems with his hand, writing. Um, so it's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> I mentioned Art Nouveau, and these are two of the more surprising things to find in his work. What you're seeing with thumb, a shot is a proof for uh, a musical score. With Updike, he did a lot of musical scores. He did a lot of covers, not the interiors. The interiors were printed by the printers of uh, G. Shermer, Skirmer, but Updike would do the covers, or sometimes introductory pages. And a lot of them were uh, lettered or decorated by Dwiggins. This one's unusual because it has this sort of Art Nouveau lettering. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I was trying to do that. Uh, oh, now we're all screwed up. I'm not used to. There we are. Will that do it? Sorry. I used to PCs. Anyway, the Femme shot has a little bit of the looseness of Art Nouveau. And I keep thinking he, he took that image of the woman and the cat from a French poster. But I can't find it in Steinland. I'm still looking to figure out. I know I've seen it somewhere. <laughs> the League of Friends is not signed by him. Uh, somebody, I think, uh, Ray Nash attributed to him. 
but it, it comes from a group of uh, cards that were probably done for Mr. Grover in Chicago. And it's definitely copying George Oriol's lettering, who was a French uh, Art Nouveau artist of the 1890s, early 20th century. And Oz Cooper copied Oriol's lettering. So it's possible that this actually is not Dwiggins and Oz Cooper, but I like to think it's Dwiggins. Well, we're never going to get through the rest of it, so I'm going to have to quit if you don't have time. So I'm just going to show, I'll just flip through these because they want to give, they want to have 15 minutes for questions. So this is upper and lower case or book hand. And what you're seeing a lot is drawn letters, not always calligraphic ones. That is not dri written directly with a pen. These are, these are greeting cards from the 1905-1910 the period. This is a little sample from a, from a book for uh, teaching children art. It was a series of uh, books done by uh, Grover's publishing company in Chicago by a woman who was an important art educator at the time. And a lot of stuff in there, which is not signed, is by Dwiggins. This one has a little tiny W-A-D on it. These are pages from little books he did. And that A is, I think, taken from Earhart Ratdolt. Those, that's entirely written out, both of those. There's no type in either of these. And the same with this uh, little uh, motto for uh, the, the Lewis Prang Company, he did in 1911. There's two different versions of that, different colors. And then you're seeing uh, his certificate he gave out to his fictitious society of calligraphers, honorary members. Uh, with Kobodaishi writing across the water and a stencil T. And this one was uh, done for Fred Gowdy. You couldn't, you couldn't join his society. You had to be invited. Is that the end? No, it can't be. There is a famous chart from his, his uh, booklet on the investigation of uh, physical properties of books showing book quality going downhill. So that's drawn letters, so it can bust apart. And then his little book, The Fabulous, he's totally written it out by hand. That's a story of his, of his own, 1921. So these are things from his paperwork through Brad Stevens. More for the paperwork. From S.D. Warren, these are all 1920s. Book jacket for Alfred Knopf from the 1930s. More for Alfred Knopf from the 30s. His own book, Land Advertising, this is a second edition from the 40s, and you're seeing original artwork on the left. On the, on the left, you're seeing um, lettering, illustration, and borders for an edition of Milton that he did for uh, Updike in 1907. And then next to it, a uh, card for, uh, for uh, Alfred Bartlett printed by Updike. Another card for Bartlett and his announcement of, of moving into Boston. And he's gotten rid of his scribe, his monkish scribe, and replaced it with a guy he calls the Digger. And a, and a quotation from Voltaire about tending your own garden. And that became his little, his little figure for a couple years, his little symbol. And this is actually the draft. Updike convinced him to get rid of the italic and replace it with type, which it looked better. Updike was right. On the left is the, uh, the rules of being a member of the Society of Calligraphers, if you're an honorary member, which are pretty easy. And then a page of a little booklet he did for the telephone company that was given out to new employees, entirely handwritten the booklet. Another example of his work for Updike in, in sheet music, that's a proof. That's why there's black bars around it. And that entire thing is hand drawn. And there's some other versions where type replaces his lettering for editions in different, in different uh, countries. The, the sofa is from an ad in uh, Vogue magazine uh, for Payne Furniture Company in Boston. He did, I don't know, 300 or so ads for them. This is one of the biggest. That's his lettering, no type at all. There's the envelope for a society of calligraphers. He didn't do a lot of swashes, you'll notice. He was, he was very restrained in his work. This is the one time when he decided to go to town. 
a uh, letter to, to his friend Rudolf Ruzika, inviting him to be an honorary member of the society. So there, you can see his handwriting done very carefully, trying to look fancy, but still handwriting. And then next to it, a page from uh, one of his book on marionettes, which was handwritten out at the end of the 30s. Some examples of, geez, sorry, too close to the mic. Uh, examples of uh, little labels for himself. Uh, and it's fascinating in the, in the Boston Public Library to see all the variations as he's trying out different designs and there's artwork that's whited out, that's inked in, that's changed. And so you can see in, in uh, the one right, um, I don't know if I can point, the one on the upper right, you can see the white paint that's oxidized. Uh, and he liked these combinations of scripts and Roman cat and Roman letters. Very wonderful combinations. If you see how his name is W. H. Wiggins in script, then 30 Levitt Street in upper and lower case, then capitals, and different ways of mixing up those, those styles. Uh, he began to get a very distinctive personal script in his that he and it's essentially a pointed pen letter that he would put his own uh, thicks and thins in, you know, noodle it up sometimes, and just leave it. And you can see it here on these, on these two pieces for Warren in about 1922. What you're seeing as a ghost behind the one on the left is a questionnaire that printers are supposed to do so they can keep track of jobs. Uh, original artwork for his uh, book, um, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So these are uh, chapter headings and parts of uh, the title. Original artwork on the left for an S.D. Warren early 1930s piece. And another one on the right. And he had an interesting fat face letter. You see the words Cumberland Dull that he began doing somewhere in the 1920s into the early 30s. Um, this is from an ink blotter for a friend of his who was a printer. He sent out, uh, I think, four of them. This one has a lot of lettering on it. The other ones have really beautiful illustrations. Uh, they're from roughly 1936, 37. And here is some of his other sort of casual uh, script styles. A little ad for a jewelry company, about 1912. And then his little publication when he was trying to do printing. Uh, in the early teens, that's him saying hello by the, near the curtain. And my favorite, probably Dwiggins design of all time, is new ideas in illustration. You can sit there in your easy, your easy chair with your airbrush and your little stencil, and your 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 faithful uh, man will pump the air pressure, and you can do automatic art. <laughs> That's from 1915 for Warren. There's actually several versions of that. And then a book plate for he and his wife with a little uh, stencil figure that he reuses a lot, this griffin. And I don't know what bitum nebo means. I still can't find it. It's got to be some play on Latin. <laughs> but look at that L through Libris. Isn't that stunning? He made his own checks. We should all do that. Here's a couple of them. Book plate for the local library. His, his, his wife was a member of the women's club. Book plates for neighbors in Hingham. And here's a couple sketches uh, along with the final one in red. But I, I kind of like the other two <laughs> on the right. And those crazy runic letters, <laughs> top and bottom. For his marionette performances, he made tickets. So it's all hand lettered and individually color, color stenciled. So there are copies without the colors. Book jacket for the, the founder of Esquire. It's an interesting book actually to read. But that, and then on the binding for John Hersey's Bell for Adano in the 40s. One more spring, the call of mine, just to rip, see some his scripts. He doesn't do formal pointed scripts. You will not find a nice Spencerian or, or English round hand or copper plate. And my, probably my favorite of his scripts is uh, the text for his edition of Poe that he did for Lakeside Press. All the images have captions handwritten out, and that's a detail on the right. So he could do very consistent if he wanted to. They didn't have to be these loose styles. Uh, another one for Strathmore in the early 30s. 
and from a book on American alphabets, he contributed this wiry monoline script. He could probably make it out of wire. And we can't go through it all. But that one's interesting. That's a very unusual thing to see for Dwiggins. Uh, for Life magazine. This is not the life of pictures. This is Life the Humor magazine. And he briefly did covers and then we went back to the old style. People didn't like his covers. Millennium One was a book, uh, was, a, was a marionette play he did. And that's his own cover. The Sportsman, another 1920s magazine, has that fat face I talk about. And then the purchase is a little uh, label for Alfred Knopf. Briefly, a direct advertising changed his covers for like three issues, went back to the other one. But I like this one on the left. And Rags was another uh, paper company promotion. He did three or four issues of theirs. The most interesting of them, oh, I don't have it here, I'll have it later. Some book jackets, I'm sorry, book jackets for Knopf. You don't find much, much in the way of sans serif in his work, but this early magazine, The Initial, and the Cornhill Booklet, which is Alf Alfred Bartlett publication. Uh, original artwork for a story by his cousin, Lawrence Siegfried, and an early book, ja uh, book binding for Knopf. Very strange, Homer in the Sagebrush, with a weird mix of lowercase and cap letters at lowercase a. This was a little seal for a paper company. They briefly used it, went back to a crappy one. A, uh, another paper company's piece from 1913, the person dictated a letter. And then he did little, uh, air, he did little um, mailing label stamps later in his life. And this is the airmail one. He also did first class and, and postage due. Paper company on the left, the Vogue paper illustration. I love the way the woman is leaning on an invisible armchair. And new ideas in illustration, a different version with a guy with a giant bow tie. These are from the teens. Another book plate for a friend. And notice how he put his, his initials in. On the left, WAD, and the date, 1929 on the right. His own book, Paris of Stories, and a book plate, and, and a little invitation card for a friend of his. He did all the invitations for over a decade for Mr. Pepper. But this is the best of them all. Open spread from a magazine for Filene's, the department store called Clothes, and that's Twiggins' illustration stencil and his lettering. James Kane's Serenade in the 30s. This is the uh, binding. The jacket is also famous, but the black binding is pretty cool in, in silver stamping. And then uh, a year earlier, this other one is an offset apparently. The one on the right, not letterpress. That's why you see that tonal variation. And my favorite rags and paper is that one. That is a stunning mix of letter forms. It just looks like a frosting on the cake. He always was a contrarian. So for his typefaces, he didn't put his typefaces on the covers of their brochures. He put hand lettering on. <laughs> so here's his, his specimen announcing his Caledonia type. There's no Caledonia type on it on the cover. And there's that same style of letters you see in Caledonia in the Borzoi Reader for Knopf in 36. And then around that time, he made what were called Plimpton Initials, done for a printing company in uh, Massachusetts called the Plimpton Press, which did all his books for Knopf. And he made a series of four initials only for their use. And this is a decorative, this is one of the decorative ones. I was trying to stay away from type, but I had to show you a little bit. Uh, this is from that same little insert that had the unshul, the drums, the calcapan. And you can see the illustration and this odd fat lettering in Salem, which his type company wanted to turn into a typeface. And he tried a few examples and gave up. And there they are. And there you can see a little bit of artwork for the colophon and magazine in this style before he did the Plimpton initials earlier in the 30s. And another one of the Plimpton initials and a few 
uh, random sketches of letters. And that's it. Oh. <laughs> well, I was speeding through because they told me to finish by 7.15.